Sports Hot Seat is brought to you in part by Sport Buff in Place Alexis Neon, where you'll find the entire line of starter sportswear. Welcome to the Sports Hot Seat, Mitch Garber with Mitch Melnick. And Mitch, our guests today have 11 Stanley Cup rings between them. Mark Hepscher of Global Television has none. And our other guest, of course, must have the other 11. Hall of Famer Henri Richard, the Pocket Rocket. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. My pleasure. 11 Stanley Cups. Now, you know, you talk to athletes who've won a couple of championships. What, what was more thrilling, the first, the second, the third? I well, mean, well, I guess, 11. I, I guess the first was... Uh, but then uh, the last one has to be the, 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 the main, uh, the main, the main uh, thrill for, for myself because of what happened in between with Al McNeil, the coach, and all this. So, and then I had scored a winning goal. So right, 1971. 1971-72. The worst coach I ever played for. Well, that's, what, that's what I said, but I didn't really mean it. I, I, I thought uh, uh, Al was a hell of a guy, good guy. And uh, not that bad of a coach, but I was mad because he didn't play me, and uh, that's my style. I wanted to play all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was a lot of incidents in that series in 1971, right? I mean, Fergie stormed off the bench before the end of a game one night in that series because he wasn't yeah, playing a whole right, lot. Right, I think. Yeah. And uh, it really set the stage for that night in Chicago. That's that's the one cup you feel you stole. Oh, there's no doubt about that. We were underdog, starting the uh, against Boston. We must have been 10 to 1 underdog. Uh, there's no way that we, we finish, I don't know how many points behind Boston, and Boston had a, a better team, but uh, this guy by the name of Ken Dryden came in and uh, stole the cup from, uh, from them, I, I don't I have to say. Speak, so, speaking of modesty, Henry, I feel a little guilty calling him Henry, but uh, <laughs> 11 Stanley Cup rings, you're wearing none. Let's see your hands. Uh, no, no, no uh, Stanley Cup. Well, of course, they're, they're too. They're, I, I feel they're heavy. They're too heavy, and I, I like very small ring. And then, uh, you know, we didn't get uh, we we didn't get any uh, first five Stanley Cup. Uh, we got, uh, I guess, the fifth one. We uh, we had to we paid half of our ring <laughs> with the team. So uh, what did they give you for the first five? Uh, in between, well, I must, I guess it was turkey or something like <laughs> that. A turkey. Which you didn't save, I guess. <laughs> During Christmas. <laughs> Which Let's we didn't save. <laughs> Hebsey, you grew up watching uh, Henri Richard play. <laughs> you were in Toronto. Henri playing for the Montreal Canadiens in the true Canadian mm. Maple Leaf rivalry days. Oh, yeah. It was great. And uh, you know what? It was, I think that a lot of people, I mean, Toronto fans, they don't hate Montreal. The, the word hate is very strong in any kind of rivalry. In the 60s, the two teams played each other 14 times a year. So it was almost impossible not to work up a, 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 an intense dislike. But at the same time with the Montreal teams, and especially with fellows like Henri Richard, I think Dave Keon was a similar in Toronto, you, you, you couldn't hate the guy. You respected him the way he played the game. And I think if you ask any Toronto Maple Leaf fan about Henri Richard, they'll grudgingly say, you know, what a great hockey player and, and, uh, and a gentleman, a classy guy, and he would never, uh, he's not the kind of a guy you could boo or, or, like with Billy Smith, you know, at the Montreal Forum when he was announced as an ambassador along with Henri and Bernie Perron to, to the 100th to the Stanley Cup. You know, people booed. They remembered battling Billy Smith. People, people would never boo Henri Richard outside of Montreal because they realized that uh, he, he came to play and he played to win, but he, he played clean and he was a gentlemanly player. And, um, you know, I think that goes a long way. Whereas a John Ferguson, for example, people may remember that he beat up a couple of guys or... Eddie Shack. Yeah, Eddie, Eddie Shack. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Eddie Shack. You know, I, I've been, I was in Toronto. I was very young. I was 16 years old. The first few games that I played against uh, St. Mike's and mm. the Marlboros, actually. And uh, people used to cheer me. They used to love me down there. Uh, that's how I got the, uh, the name Pocket Rocket. Oh, is that right? Yeah. There was an ad in a paper. I think it was the Toronto Star or mm -hmm. Globe and Mail. Which said, uh, see the rocket on Sunday, on Saturday night, and see the pocket rocket play on Sunday, on Sunday afternoon. 
that's where I got the name Pocket. And then uh, I, I always remember going down the Maple Leaf Garden, and the place was packed to over five five thousand people. Double uh, headers. Fifteen thousand people. Double headers double on headers Sundays, then, right? Yeah, right. Junior right. double headers, yeah. Yeah, and they cheer me because maybe. And then when you're smaller, I, I was only sixteen years old, weighed about one hundred and ten pounds, <laughs> and being hit by uh, Jerry James used to play with the uh, Winnipeg uh, Blue Bombers. Blue yeah. Bomber, right? Right. Uh, Henry, if I, if I were to be a future NHL hockey player, two people I wouldn't want to be would be Wayne Gretzky's little brother and right. Mario Lemieux's little brother. What about Maurice Richard's brother? Exactly. <laughs> you were Rocket Richard's yeah. little brother, but yet became a superstar. But how much, well, uh, how, how, how was it being uh, Rocket's uh, little brother starting out? You know, a uh, 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 plain hockey player I was. I wasn't a su superstar. I, I work, I, I'm a type of guy like, uh, I like to uh, Muller or, uh, Carbon, uh, hard worker, Gilmore. Hockey player. Gilmore, mm. right, Gilmore. Well, you're naming superstars now, too. Well, not in the same class, maybe, as like Mario class. and Rocket. No, and, and that's uh, it. And uh, forget what I, want, I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about, about, being, about being the Rocket's kid brother. Yeah, right. Oh, I didn't. Uh, yeah, it must have been. Uh, yeah, it must have been pretty tough. I must have had a, a lot of pressure, but I didn't really feel it. Hmm. I wanted to play hockey all my life. That's what I wanted to do. And. Uh, uh, it's funny, in school they asked me what I wanted to do when I grew up. I always said a brickler. A brickler. I never bricklayer. Said, a bricklayer. <laughs> <laughs> I never said a hockey player because I was, you know, kind of shy. They, they would say that he's pretty cocky, but that's the way I felt. I wanted to play with Montreal Canadiens. Then, today they want to play in the NHL, but they don't care where. So it, it didn't take you uh, long to establish yourself on your own, in your own mind, about having to follow the Rockets' oh, skates. Oh, yeah, there's no doubt about that. I didn't feel, you know, I didn't feel I was, uh, uh, I didn't feel any pressure. I must have had a pressure, but I didn't feel it. Uh, my style was different than Morris. I was a playmaker more than uh, trying to score goals. Did, did you feel did it? he talk to you? I wonder if he, if your brother would say to you, look, Henri, you just do your thing and I'll do my thing. No, did he it's help funny. You? It's funny. No, never talk to me. Never? Uh, never talk to me in, uh, about hockey or after the game. Never did. La no, last, week we had, last week we had Dickie Moore on, and he said that in his, I think it was eight years, he played with Rocket on the same line. They never talked about hockey once. That's right. <laughs> and now you say you never spoke to the Rocket about hockey. Right, right. Has he the Rocket spoke ever spoken about hockey? No, he never spoke to me about hockey. <laughs> he never so. spoke to anybody about <laughs> hockey. He just didn't want to give up a secret. Hey, he played the <laughs> he game. He never spoke to me. Yeah. <laughs> Why did he have to speak about it? He could play it so well. Yeah. What did he have to talk about Well, he was more? on that line, too. Right. I mean, Dickie yeah, Moore. Dickie and Morris, yeah. When yeah. I first what a line. I, I actually yeah. started with uh, Bellevue and Bert Olmsted because the very first shift, uh, very first game that I played with Montreal, uh, Bum Bum Jeffrey on the earth. And then they put me at, on the right wing with uh, Olmsted and uh, Bellevue for maybe a few games till Jeffrey on came back. Did, did you, were you ever in awe of your own brother? Did you ever like shake your head and go, how did he do that? I mean, did you ever stop and find yourself enjoying yourself watching your brother play? Uh, oh, before I joined Canadian, yes. But uh, while I was there, no, not really. Uh, don't forget, Morris was at the end of his playing days when I first came up. Uh, actually, he, he, I think he, he's saying that very often that uh, uh, he wouldn't. I don't think he would have go any longer. I, when I when I came in Montreal, that's how he he decided to play again because he didn't want to. He thought he was finished. He was a little overweight and he had problem with his weight. So. What's the age difference between you two? Or 15 years difference. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, he was already well established when you were still... Right, well, I was only six years old when he first started in 1940, <coughs> 40, 41, 42, I guess. Uh -huh. We have the Rockets' uh -huh. last goal here. Uh, you were on the ice. This was in 1960, the fifth of your five consecutive Stanley Cups. Mm -hmm. The Maple Leafs were the victims, Johnny Bauer. And uh, what a hell of a way to go out with a, with a nice backhand. Uh, do you remember? Do you remember that play? I, I don't remember. It's, it's, it's been quite a few years. <laughs> if I see it, I'll remember. We're gonna we're gonna get to it in in, in just a second. There it is. Here we go. I think. Uh, yeah, you Timmy were, Horton, there's Henri. Right? Who are you this chasing the there? Tim Horton. Yeah, Tim Horton. Richard's yeah. final goal. The rocket goes behind the net. The puck squirts loose in front. A backhander. Oh. Vintage Richard. Now we see him no more. I uh, went in around the net and uh, made a pass to, I think, to Henry or Dickie Moore. And after that, the puck hit the goalkeeper, and uh, I picked up the puck, and I let go of backhand, and uh, I finally got uh, that goal. 
I remember the rocket. The rocket. What, uh, <laughs> what did you feel when he announced his retirement? I don't know. I, you know, I really don't know. I, uh, I don't really remember when he did actually announce his retirement because it, actually he played, he trained with us, and I think he had score, and and, and that uh, game camp. that and, and that training camp, that game that we played before because we used to scrimmage quite a bit, and I think Maurice has scored th three goals, so I was very surprised. But, that he, he, he retired. But it certainly gave you your own identity after that from, from 1960 right through to, uh, when was your last year, 74? 70, 74, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you certainly, you escaped his shadow. Yeah, I did, but I was, you know, I, I was pretty good goal scorer then uh, as a junior. And then I, I kind of lost a little bit of that. I was more a playmaker because of Morris. I, I was looking for him most of the time on the ice to give him the puck. So I, I, I became a, a playmaker, which I wish I was, I was dreaming to be a Maurice Richard when I was <laughs> very young. I said, I'm going to score many goals, but that's one thing I didn't do. I didn't score too many. Henry, how much has the game changed? Obviously, the players are a lot bigger. They're a bit faster. They've got newer equipment. Uh, there's so many changes in the game. But when you retired in 74, <laughs> that was the end of an era. Most fans thought Henry could play forever. You still look exactly the same as you did during your playing days. Not a, not a year has gone by, you, it seems. You, you, you wouldn't know you don't. You didn't know me then. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't alive. Yeah, I don't then. think you were alive. <laughs> I, I watched Henry Richard play for, for many years until your retirement. I used to go to every game at the Montreal Forum and you were my favorite hockey player for a different reason because I was very well, small and still am. Size. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, Henry you Richard can succeed, well, yeah. you know, why not? But when you retired, it seemed like the end of an era. That No more Richards, Beliveau, all the guys were but then, the then there's, the there's quite a few other guys that, you know, like Guy Lafleur that came up. I actually played uh, the last two, uh, two years with uh, Lafleur. <laughs> my last, actually my last game was with uh, Lafleur and uh, uh, Steve Schott in, uh, was remember, in, in Buffalo. Buffalo. The that's where I, that's where I broke my ankle, actually, in November. In and Washington. Then, and uh, no, I did, uh, st uh, against, uh, against Buffalo. I think it was in, no, it was in Montreal, against Buffalo. Larry Carrier actually hit me behind the net. And, uh, that used to bother accident. me so much in that, in that series against the Sabres, 74-75. They had all these big defensemen, Jerry Korab, mm -hmm. and they were constantly taking runs at, at little Henri Richard. And Wait. there's nobody on the Canadians did anything about it. Hmm. Well, uh, Because at that time, you remember Bobby Clark. If anybody touched Bobby yeah, Clark right, at the Flyers, right, they'd right, bring right. up the farm team from Hershey <laughs> the right, next right, time. Right. And it, it, at, in fact, after that, that's when the Canadians got yeah, a little that, tougher. Yeah, that was in, well, that was in the playoff, I guess, because <coughs> I didn't come back till the playoff. I hurt myself in November, broke my ankle, came back in, uh, in the playoff, uh, and we got beat against uh, by, uh, Buffalo, I guess it was. Yeah. And then I always remember, for the very first shift, the game was held in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, Buffalo. And the uh, very first shift, it, he put me on against uh, Perrault, the French Connection, and I just couldn't believe it that he put me on because I, you know, I was just returned back. to, uh, didn't play for uh, five, six months. So, uh, that was and Scotty. then we went on to lose uh, Scotty Bowman. Yeah. Yeah. You also played a few years with uh, Kenny Dryden, who came up in 71. Right. And right. we talk a lot about, uh, the big joke is, if you retired every great former Canadian's number, they'd be have numbers in the hundreds right now, there'd be right. no numbers <laughs> between, you know, between one and 40. Um, Ken Dryden is a number that wasn't retired, and it's been used by several players since, since Ken Dryden. Was Ken one of the great Montreal Canadiens? Oh, yeah, Canadians? There, there's no doubt about that. He was a great, uh, a great goalie. But, uh, you know, uh, he didn't play that long. Well, he played seven years, I guess he did. He was, in his these, in these seven years, the best, the greatest in seven years. But uh, I think Jacques Planck, in my mind, is the best that i ever seen because he, he did quite a, quite a bit for hockey, and he, he was quite a goalie, believe me. And uh, like I said, you were talking about Dryden, I agree that he was super, you know, that uh, well, thing coming back to that, Stanley Cup, we won in 1971, 72 against Boston and then Chicago. I think Dryden was because of him, but we won, there's no. How much contact do you have with your former teammates, Ken Dryden, Guy Lafleur, and all the way back to Dickie Moore? And, uh, well, well, I, see, I see Dickie quite a bit, uh, the old timer, uh, the old timer room there that we have at the forum. Uh, Ken, I see him once in a while in Toronto, or he comes to Montreal, 
and other guys. I see ki guitar, but I see quite a bit. And then again, we meet a lot of we met we meet a lot of uh, the old former hockey player in uh, in our room there at the farm. Uh, you had a question about Keith Talbot, which was uh, <coughs> yeah, I thought it was a pretty answer been well, given. The <laughs> well, the answer's been given. Was well, half the answer actually? Well, you know, I mean, everyone knows that eleven Stanley Cups is a record that, that may never be broken again. I don't think I don't see a I team dominating so. the so. way the Montreal Canadiens did in the during the Henri Richard yeah. era. But along for the ride on those great teams were some excellent defensemen, and two of them had each won eight Stanley Cups, which is a record for defensemen. Jean Guy Talbot is one, and Henri remembered that one. And the other one is Serge Savard, who played. Um, in the late 60s on a couple of cup winners and then throughout the 70s on those great teams with right. with Ken Dryden. To win to win eight Stanley Cups for a defenseman is, is it's quite phenomenal when you uh, you consider the goaltenders and he and, and I already mentioned I mean Jacques Plante there's a guy that Toronto fans hated because he was so good and he came up always came up with the big save at the right time and eventually became a Toronto Maple Leaf you know different kind of a guy strange guy the whole thing the whole story with the mask I mean, there was an illusion about a Jacques Plante. People weren't sure what kind of a guy he was, but they knew he could certainly stop a puck. You know, and, and uh, when, in those days, if you didn't see the, fel the guy's face, like nowadays it's tough to recognize a player. In those days, if you didn't see the guy's face, you didn't know what kind of a player he was. No one wore helmets. You could tell, the, you know, you could look at his hockey card, look at the guy on TV. But Jacques Plante, there was a mysterious aura about Jacques Plante behind that mask. When no one else was wearing a mask, you know, Johnny Bauer didn't wear a mask in those days, and Glenn well, Hall didn't wear a mask in those nobody days. Nobody used to, nobody wore <coughs> a mask. That's how Jacques Plan started right. that. And it's almost, it, it almost made him better because he was more feared because you couldn't see an expression on his face. You can only see that mask. And was, he, sorry, was he a strange guy, Jacques Plant? I mean, by athletes' standards? Was All goalie are strange guys. That's true. <laughs> true. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like baseball pitchers. Goalies and catchers. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was uh, talking to Bernie Parra and uh, Billy Smith, and I was telling him, Telling these things that uh, goalie are different. They're really different. Yeah, but, in, their but own, he, in their own ways. He was viewed in some areas, Jacques Plan, as, as a as a problem, as a malcontent, uh, lazy. Yeah, they call yeah, him very lazy. Very lonesome, man. lonesome guy. He never came out with uh, with the, all the players. Usually, we Montreal uh, we used to go all together after the game, and Jacques Plan was a lonely guy. He never used mm. to come. Well, that's very rarely. Who was your best friend on, on the Canadians teams? Then, uh, well, that was Claude Provo, that died uh, nine years ago now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, great check. Guy, Guy Talbot, Dickie Moore was a great friend of mine. We have a lot of fun. Were you? Cl what about the second wave of the Canadians teams that you played on the Stanley Cup winners of the late 60s and 70s? Uh, I'll you tell you, uh, as a good friend of mine, as, uh, Frank Mavlich, we were about the same age and he came with Montreal and I used to hang around with Frank quite a bit. Another guy Frank had a bothers me. Now, that, that bothered me that Frank, Frank Mahovlich got away from the Maple Leafs. That was Punch Imlach's fault. Right? Punch Imlach <laughs> would, would give Frank a hard time, called him Mahalovich on purpose <laughs> and called and said, you know, and, and Frank I think had, I mean this was a nervous breakdown or yeah. close to it because of Punch Imlach. Punch ridiculed him in front of the other players and the press and thought he should be a better hockey player. Remember Frank scored 48 goals in 61 or 62 and they, th you know, they say if you score that many goals one year, that you better be scoring that many yeah. goals every year. And he went down, and, and Punch really gave him a hard time. And in one of the biggest trades ever, in 1967, he traded you know, Mahovlich, Paul Henderson, Gary Unger to Detroit for uh, yeah. Norm Ullman, Floyd Smith. I'm sorry, Paul Henderson came from Detroit to mm -hmm. Toronto. But I mean, it was a huge ch trade, and then eventually he ended up with Montreal. And that was a great; those were great teams. Yeah. Frank Mahovlich, Peter Mahovlich. I mean, this, the, the Canada Cup team of se or the '72 right. Canada team. Look at the Montreal Canadiens that represented that team. There was a, the middle of two eras almost. I mean, you were still playing, and uh, you know, and, okay. uh, Montreal made good trade uh, like that trade. Great trade. Frank from Detroit coming to Montreal. That's. The reason that we, another good reason that we won that that Stanley Cup. You didn't. Frank on our team. Sorry, Henry, you didn't play in '72. Did that bother you? Uh, the Russian series, the Canada-Russia series, yeah. A, a little bit, you know. I, no, I, I was close to be out of the game, and I uh, I just wish they would have asked me to train with them. Then I, I'm sure I would have made the team. In my mind, mm -hmm. well. I, We'll never know, but <laughs> in my mind, I want I would have loved to go, at least to ask me to practice to, to go and train in training camp with these guys. Was there a sense, Henry, just before the '72 series, while they were talking about it and preparing for it, that it could become as big as it did become? Did you know no, this is going to be a major world no, event? Not really. Hmm. No, I don't think anybody could 
thought about that. Uh, first of all, we thought that the the Canadian would walk away with uh, <laughs> with the, all the games, which they didn't, as everybody knows. And you watched it with the same enthusiasm, I guess, as most hockey fans who weren't playing. Right, the and uh, I think everybody remembers where they were at that time, the last everyone. game. <coughs> uh, where were you? Were you at your bar? No, uh, we were in Halifax. Tra the training uh, camp. We training camp, yeah, we played. Sure, that's right, September, there, so. yeah. 72, yeah. 72, 73, yeah. yeah. yeah uh, hmm. I want to ask you a question about uh, watching as a former hockey player. I wonder if when you watch the old footage of goaltenders with no masks, we were talking about how hockey has changed, do you now say to yourself, I don't know how they did it? Well, nobody knows how they did it, but in our mind, you know, we... Uh, we wouldn't try to hit the goalie, you know. They, today they they, sh they slap shot. They don't know where they're going. They slap all over. They know they won't hurt the goalie. Then we knew that if you hit them in the face, it would be uh, could be tragic. And then that's you know. So you were always conscious of the goalie we were not wearing very a mask. conscious, right? Right. That's that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> Do you think players today have less of a lower threshold of pain and for injury? I mean, in those days, without the helmets and the masks, you would get cut during a game, you would go to the bench or you would go off to the clinic, they'd sew it up, and you'd be back out there playing in the next period. Um, now, with all the equipment and everything else, it seems a player will stay on the ice longer, a trainer has to come out to get him. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, has it changed that? I mean, these the players are bigger and stronger. I wish, I wish you wouldn't mention that. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, well, was I, there, did I, you, I agree so much with you. We're, I couldn't believe. And I don't think in my 20 years that I played pro with Monarch, and I don't think I don't believe I stayed on the ice. I broke an ankle, broke a shoulder, broke an arm. Came off the ice. And I just got up to, and I <laughs> yeah. went out uh, on my knees. Limp to the bench, stay, right? <laughs> they call, and they call him Little Henry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how much is it, do you think TV has to? Everybody knows his cameras are on. Yeah, it could, uh, could be. But so if the cameras were on, if the cameras are on, you wouldn't want the camera to catch you lying on the ice. No. Well, I guess so. You I want the camera to get you going right. off the ice. <laughs> it's like right. the guy in baseball. When you get hit by a pitch, you never rub the spot right. where you got hit. You don't want anyone to know you're hurt until the you next run hit off the first base. Until the next hitter up. That's right. That's Nobody right. notices then. Yeah, that's but true. And then you rub. The <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's, I find that the, you know that a lot of cases recently is especially almost like in soccer where the guy will try to draw a foul and he'll be in writhing in agony on the field in hockey we, we've gotten more of that and it happened the other night too and i'm trying to think who it was um where um, one of the uh, king's players appeared to be hurt luke robitaille got knocked down okay. and then and he was lying there and they didn't blow the whistle and he got up after about 10 seconds and got right back into the play and the fans all went yeah you weren't hurt interesting, uh -huh. interesting you weren't hurt interesting you mentioned luke robitaille because uh, prior to game one luke robitaille apparently looked into the stands and saw I shouldn't say the ghost of Henri Richard, Henri Richard. because uh, yeah. he's very much alive. Yes. He saw Henri Richard, but saw the ghost of Henri Richard's achievements pass and said, I can't disappoint Henri Richard. Henri Richard is going to be watching this game. All the accomplishments that someone like Henri has had in this forum is going to pump me up to play better. Yeah. So you, many times we talk, about, yeah, we talk about players who come in here and get intimidated by the ghosts of the Canadians' past, mm -hmm. but Luke Robitaille came in and said, I'm not going to be intimidated by it. I'm going to live up to had that feel to know that Luke Robitaille was actually looking at Henri Richard. Yeah, that's what he said. Yeah, he was inspired by you. Right. Absolutely. Well, actually, you were his I, I, I saw him, uh, I was at the, uh, the, the warm-up there before the game. That's what he's talking and about. And then he was talking to some people. I was right behind the bench of Montreal, just talking to people. And he looked at me and said, he said hi. That's all. That, that was it. Any players call you Mr. Richard? Yeah, that, w that w makes me pretty uh, <laughs> old. <laughs> well, isn't, you were, uh, isn't it a thrill when they come up to you, though, to, the, to, to be recognized still? Oh, yeah. By uh, today's sure, players. Sure, I mean, it is a thrill. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of kids, five, six, years, uh, six, seven, ten years old. They know me because of the uh, hockey, hockey, card, hockey yeah. card. But now now they come to me and said, uh, could I have an autograph of my grandfather? I don't mind what they say, therefore. <laughs> 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 Now you had a very successful uh, business establishment on Park Avenue. Mark used to frequent it quite a bit. He used to live in the area. I used to, I used to have some yeah. meals there. Uh -huh. A lot of former Canadians went into that business. Oh yeah, uh, former and uh, pre present uh, yeah. hockey player. Then when I, the team, uh, you know, I had that from 1960 to had that 26 years. So uh, I invite the player every time we won the Stanley Cup. They all came to my place. Even when we lost, they came after the uh, season. So. I had that for 20, 26 years and six months, actually. So what was it that made, was it a tie-in with Molson that made it easy, or what was it with so many players ending up no, running, running an establishment all, no, like not that? No, not at all, because I, you know, I, 
You know, as a kid, I dreamed to play hockey. I dreamed to play with Montreal Canadian. I wanted to have a tavern. I don't know why, because I knew I, I wouldn't go to school and I, the tavern would be easy to, to run. <laughs> so, uh, and I dreamed to, not I dream, I, as a kid, I, I wanted to marry the wife that I'm, my wife that I'm still married with. I was six years old when I met her. Wow. And I married her. <laughs> Childhood sweetheart. <laughs> right. Let's be serious though, Mitch. If you're going to open a tavern, it better be Henri Richard, Jacques Lemaire, Yvon Cornway. I yeah. mean, Patrice Brisebois Tavern, I don't think we have the same effect today. No offense to Patrice or Eric Desjardins or uh, yeah. any of the presidents. Or even if Larry Hillman had opened the tavern. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it would have done very well. <laughs> no, you know what happened? It would move every two years to another city. <laughs> That's right. right. A suitcase. What, what about a donut? But donut Tim, Tim Horton. Horton. Yeah, yeah, you know what's funny is they're in the States, Tim Horton Donuts, and people, yeah. I mean, the name Tim Horton means virtually nothing to a lot of people right. but you go to florida right. and it's tim horton's donuts and yeah. it's like and they who? don't know the guy and he never know. lived to see how big it had it's become unbelievable. That's too bad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's really it's just uh it's something to talk about all the old players I and mean, it shouldn't call them the old players but you show up at the montreal forum and you see how the fans react to you and you see how they swarm around you and then you got a guy like roby tie it's funny you know he sees you and it's like he's he's intimidated by you almost but when you see wayne and mario are you taken aback by some of the things that they can do on the ice? They're impressed to see you, but are you impressed to see them? Oh, I'm impressed to see them for sure. Believe me, those guys are unbelievable. The guy Wayne Gretzky, Mario Lemieux, they're over everybody else. Anybody who's played as long as you, you gotta, you probably answered the question a zillion times, but we gotta ask you before we leave. Or Harvey, the Rocket, Howe, Gretzky, Lemieux, <laughs> if you had to pick the best ever all-around player. Let's eliminate the rocket. Forget about yeah, the rocket. Yeah, well, the best all-around before Wayne Gracie came in, and it was Bobby Orr. Mm. I had to go with Bobby Orr. Uh, great, the greatest hockey player that I ever. And then Wayne Gretzky after came in, and then Mario Lemieux came in. So uh, those three guys are best, the best hockey player that I've seen. We got 30 seconds. I have Mark. a question, Henri. You seem to me most players, former players, are bitter for one reason or another about the money that the new guys are making or the success that they have. You don't appear. In fact, yeah. you're the opposite. You appear. No. You appear to be the type of guy who wishes them all the best and uh, and uh, hopes that the sport that you played and you made your living from continues to flourish. I think that's great. Yeah, believe me, I don't. Uh, money is not everything in life. I guess uh, if if you're happy, as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm a millionaire because I do what I want to do and I don't need the money. Of course you need money, but uh, uh, being alive and being in good health is the main thing. That's Henri great. Richard, continued good health, and this has been more than a thrill, I think, for all of us. For Mitch Melnick, Mark Hepscher, and Henri Richard, thank you very much for watching the Sports Hot Seat, and we'll catch you on the very next edition.